Now, may I call you Dr. Yusuf, just just for <laughs> sheer value? If, if you want, I'll, I'll have to put in a, a legal disclaimer. <laughs> no, let's not do that then, okay. Welcome to the Propane Fitness Podcast. I am really excited to have Kit Lachlan here today with me. So I met Kit at his seminar in London, and uh, this was a two-day stretching workshop, which we'll get into what I love about Kit specifically is that he is a logician, he's extremely well grounded in the anatomy and physiology, actually more than some of the staff at med school. Um, and uh, so he's an ex-academic, massage therapist, medical anthropologist, ex-weightlifter, and he's had some experience in the trenches as well. Um, there is really no better authority on stretching in the world at the moment. So you're very privileged to be listening to this episode. So uh, he's actually transformed his own body from someone who was very stiff and very immobile as a weightlifter into a super slinky man. And he was walking around at the weekend saying, feel me anywhere, I'm soft all over. So hello, Kit. Have I missed anything out in that introduction there? <laughs> No, look, the, the soft all over thing, that's a, it's very interesting, isn't it? Because basically, we were, we were talking about cultural memes before, but let me just elaborate on this a tiny bit using that as an example. The reason why no one, I, on workshops, you must have seen me do this a dozen times, I'll just pat someone's tummy and just say, no, just, just relax, relax your tummy. And firstly, there's that startle kind of shock, you know, oh God, I'm being touched. Then secondly, there's the realisation that, holy shit, I'm holding myself rigidly when in fact I'm in a totally protected workshop environment. There are no wild animals about to jump through the window and no one's threatening me. So why am I holding all this tension? But the, the deeper reason why, apart from the fact that most people do feel afraid at some medium to low level all the time or most of the time, there's something else in play here which is extremely interesting to me and that is the image of a young man, especially a young athletic fit man, has to be like this. Do you know what I mean? A little bit of lat spread in order to make your shoulders look wider and just all that stuff. It's unnecessary tension. And the model that we use on our workshops, and we must have spoken about it on the workshop that we met on, is our goal is to have a body like a cat. And the idea of that is, firstly, if you've ever watched cats, you'll know they're relaxed 99.9% .9 of the time. But when they when they launch themselves from I'm being relaxed, I'm not connect, I'm in this environment, but I'm not actually being moved around by it, I'm not being affected by it internally and all that sort of thing, which is typical cat behavior. You know, if you walk into a room and they and they just give you a little ear flick like this, that's a massive acknowledgement. And if you just think about a dog for a moment, what would a dog be doing? You walk into the room and, <laughs> you know, Am I in your good books or am I in your bad books today? You know, as, as you look around the lounge and you see that your puppy has spread two rolls of toilet paper around the whole room, that sort of thing. Cats are just so different in this regard. But, as you know, every size cat from the smallest to the largest, and we compare them to all the members of the dog family, all cats for the same size are about 70% more powerful than a dog of, of a, any particular size. They have the same neural systems, they have almost identical skeletons, they have the same muscle to skeleton weight ratio. What is the difference? Well, the, there are two main differences. One is that cats, cats are not controlled by what you're thinking about them. We, we're much, as humans, we're much more dog-like than cat-like. The locus of a dog's attention is outside itself on you. In a cat, it's not. That's the first thing. And the second thing, and this will bring us back to the subject at hand, is that every day, every cat licks every square inch of its own body. It's the most elaborate yoga routine that the world has ever seen, and it goes unremarked. But it, while we sit here, just, just try to lick your own right hip. You know, it's really impossible. And yet we have the, we have the same number of bones in our, in our um, vertebral column as a cat does. Now, all right, there's proportional differences and all that kind of thing. But the fact is, cats are simply more relaxed. But if you ever try to make a cat do something it doesn't want to do, it will show you how it can move from being completely soft, because that relaxation, when you pick up a cat, they're so relaxed, one end hangs over your hand like this and the other hand, and they, right, they feel like they've got no bones. But the instant 
you or some outside agency tries to make it do something it doesn't want to do, it will literally transform itself into this shredding machine, shredding, biting, scratching machine. And unlike dogs, an instant after that engagement will be completely relaxed. <clears throat> an hour after a dog's had a fight with a cat, it's still running around on tippy toes, just like us, thinking, that damn cat. So there's, there's two lessons here. One is the locus of your attention. Where is it? And what kind of attention is it? Are you really concerned about what other people think about you, for example? Um, and if so, in what way do you think about how other people think about you? And the second thing is having a limber body, which has a very relaxed muscle tone when at rest. And so my reason for saying to people in the workshop, well, look, come over. I'm an old person, but come over and just feel how soft my body is. And then you've also seen how strong I am too. The, the, the paradox is we are constructed by myths of the buff hard body, uh, you know, hard body, one word, you know, it's a modern word now. Men and women are described the same way. That hard body is not only low body fat, it's also tension in the body that makes the muscles be visible. When you look at someone who's relaxed, you can't see any muscles. It's just a shape. That's what I'm talking about. So this is a great extra element about the wanting approval. I've been listening to a guy called Anthony DeMello recently who is, I think, Episcopal preacher. I might, might have got that wrong. But he describes mm. humans as um, puppets to wanting approval from other people and that we're all addicts to our drug and that any interaction we have with anyone else is just looking for our fix. And when someone says, I like you, they press the button and we, we wake up and then they say, I don't like you. And, and we just react so mechanically. And it's interesting to say, to see how that impacts the body as well, very much. Oh. And that segues us oh. quite nicely. Sorry, go ahead. One thing, it, it impacts the body massively, Yusuf. Look, I'll just give you a quick, a quick. Um, you know, are you familiar with the term Gedanken, thought experiment? No. It's a German word, and we philosophers use it all the time, and I worked in the philosophy department for many years. So we'll just do a thought experiment. Okay, you're at home with your lover. You've had a lovely meal, glass of wine or two, and you're feeling mellow, man. You're just chilling, and you're, you're really actually experiencing internal state of immense pleasure, relaxed kind of pleasure. And the phone rings. No big deal. You walk over to the phone, you pick up the phone, and in the instant of recognizing that it's the hated father-in-law, your body literally transforms itself into hated father-in-law mode, exactly like that. But here's the thing. This, this mofo is actually in Reykjavik in a secure facility. He's insane. But it, it doesn't matter the fact that he cannot hurt you or repeat anything that you've had with him in the past your body adopts this particular shape that is the mode, the hated father-in-law mode. And I mean, that's a, obviously that's a drawing in broad strokes here, but getting back to your, your comment about Anthony's work, literally every response you get from the other person in interaction with them literally brings about a similar, smaller scale transformation internally, which can be experienced as mildly pleasurable, very pleasurable, mildly distasteful, blah, blah, blah. It's endless. And that is my reason for using cats as my model or positioning cats um, in respect of dogs, because dogs do this too. And our, our behavior is much more dog-like as humans than it is cat-like. And I'm recommending that people move slightly more towards the cat end of the spectrum in this regard to to not not detachment, as, as, the, as the Buddhists or the yogis like to talk about it, but non-attachment. Yes, there are these things happening, but I'm nonetheless relaxed. This is a very, very difficult state for most people to achieve for precisely the reasons Anthony has given you, but there's more to it than that. Well, I think this is one of the biggest lessons that I've learned from your work, which is that all of these things that occur on a mental plane really do um, impact you physically, and I've, I've just taken this out of the library, um, The Body <sighs> and the Mind, a book that you recommended as well, um, and... I'm starting to practice Vipassana meditation as well, which again takes all of the um, all of the mental objects into physical sensations. But we can discuss that later, maybe. Um, so and we and we should because one has to be very careful with Vipassana for reasons. Perhaps we can get into later on our next chat or whatever. 
but but it sounds to me as though you've got a good teacher because your emphasis in the sentence that you put together to describe it concluded body and physical sensations right from the get-go. Um, the poor teachers tell their students to watch their thoughts, which becomes yet another mental activity on top of a mental activity. You don't want that. You absolutely, the first Satipatthana, as the, as the Buddha described in the Satipatthana Sutra, the first Satipatthana is actually the body. And always what's first in the list in any Buddha Sutra, the, the first item in the list is the most important. And so you've got the body with you all the time. If you pay attention to what it's telling you, your life will be transformed by that because the body never lies. The mind lies to you all the time, and we lie to each other all the time, or commonly anyway. But the body, it can't lie. It lives in the present, a continuously unfolding present. And if you attend to what's happening in it, it also brings the mind along with that as well, in exactly the same way as the hated father-in-law story. You're simply teaching yourself a new habit. Now, most of the habits that people have or reflexive behaviors that people have have been unconsciously learned or learned without awareness, and they, in fact, are mistaken for you. They're not you at all. They're just a, like a set of clothes, a set of habits which you look in the mirror and say, yep, this is me, this is my license number, um, and I live at such and such an address. Not really. But when you attend to what's going on inside your own body as well, all sorts of very interesting and useful things will occur. And this is the most important one. If, you're, if you have a second attention at some level on what's happening inside your body all the time, you'll be more present more often. Simple as that. So this is the basis behind your, your stretch therapy modality uh, of attending to the body, developing the, the cat-like responses mm -hmm. and no unnecessary tension that you said before. Can you tell us a bit more about what is stretch therapy? Well, look, it's a it's a shifting collection of technique, really. I I, I would not like anyone to think that um, that we believe that we've plumbed the depths of this <laughs> of this part of human experience. In fact, most of the people who claim to be experts in this field have, if I if I can put it this way, they have a a small window that gives them a particular view of the thing we're talking about. And, and, of course, because the, the expert is looking through that window, they will privilege that view and tell you that their way of doing it is the best way and better than X, Y, and Z. Well, I'm looking at it, I think, from a slightly different perspective, perhaps, perhaps through, I wouldn't like to say a bigger window, but because I've been on the planet for so long and I've had an opportunity to actually personally test so many different systems and also to incorporate them in my own body and then teach them to my students and see how the students react to those same things. And there's, there's something interesting there too, because the fact is what might work for my body may be completely ineffective for your body. There, so when you see this at work and you see that some people are responding extremely well to what you teach them, but others are not, my attention has always gone to the, the ones that are not responding because that's where the gold is. What's stopping this person from changing themselves. This is this is the core problem. How do we, no matter who we are, what we are, where we are, or what we're doing, if you've identified a desire in yourself to change, the next and the most important question is, okay, how to get from here to there? That's our area of expertise. We have so many tools in the toolbox, and the reason we have so many tools in the toolbox is that and you might remember this from the workshop, we'll try something with one person, it has no effect, we try something else, it has no effect, and the third thing we do, oh, bingo, okay, can you feel that now? The first will say, yeah, God, that feels completely different. The feeling is the mobility, the feeling is the improvement in flexibility, the connection is the first step. Most people, Yusuf, are, they live so fairly and squarely inside this space here, well, look, someone said to me this the other day, and I, was, I thought it was beautiful. When was the last time you felt the clothes that you're wearing? It is so much a part of the the noise, if I can put it, on the antenna. I'm going to mix in my metaphors a bit here. But but when, you, when you're in your Vipassana training, you will learn how to direct your attention. And for most people, that when you when you say, okay, move your awareness to X or Y, I've worked with plenty of people who say, what does that mean? 
What? What does that? How do you do that? Well, it's it's, it's very difficult, and I'm I'm certainly, and many of our listeners and readers are people that live in very sort of cerebral people, and I can't remember mm. who it was that said that the longest journey is to to go from your head to your heart. But uh, that's, oh, that's, that's I, I very that. cheesy. I've never but... heard it before. That's brilliant. Oh, okay, so um, was and you said you've got a number of tools in your toolbox. I just realised something that I didn't mention in the intro is that you have a number of different backgrounds in in uh, physical um, modalities, pursuits, I suppose, and that you've taught yoga, you've got a grounding in Western physiology. Um, yep. I'd imagine that you, you, you went, you, you were doing dance for a while as well. There's a few mm-hmm. different things that you're drawing on, which I imagine help you to, to then find the right tool for the right person. Yes. How does that contrast with your experience as an Olympic weightlifter as well? Well, I had a very good coach. I was very fortunate, and I do think if you're, if any of your listeners are either involved in, or planning, or intending, or make a decision to do some Olympic lifting, the absolute best thing they can do is to get some decent coaching. You want someone who knows what they're doing to look at the very, very first thing you do. Okay, there's the bar on the ground. Let's say it's an empty bar. It's resting on the racks, so it's at knee height or just below knee height, right? And you say, okay, just show me. Just reach down and pick that bar up. What does that look like? How do you position your body to do something? What is the habit in your body? Now, as you know, half the people will walk over the bar and instead of bending at the hips, holding the spine in a certain alignment, they'll bend in their spine and bend over like this. That's how people do things. Now, if you have that kind of lack of awareness of the biomechanics of your own body, You need to dial back that training session to some very simple, basic things, which plenty of people miss, as you know. And the reason I'm mentioning working with a coach in the beginning, most important in the beginning rather than when you become more experienced, actually, and that's something else I'll talk about later, um, you want the absolute best coaches or the best teachers when you're a beginner because you want to learn habits which have been proven elsewhere and in other people's bodies. You need to know how to do things or at least have the framework of how we know things work for the majority of people. Will we have to make um, adjustments in our individual bodies? Yes, of course. But first we have to have paint the broad strokes. So for example, if someone cannot do a front squat with the weight racked on their shoulders, or if they can't back squat and hold their spine in the same alignment from the bottom position to the top position, there are some very fundamental things that need attending to, like it could be their their glutes are inactive, for example. I mean, I'm extemporizing here, but you get what I mean. When you see the movement, if if you're an experienced coach, you can tell with accuracy what the person's doing and what they're using and how they're cueing themselves. That's also a fundamental part of our work because we we do have a strand in our system, as you know, called the monkey gym. And the monkey gym is the, the, the strength development side of the things that we do. Um, I, I'm, known, I'm known as a stretching person, but I probably know more about strength training than I do about stretching, even though I know a fair bit about stretching. So anyway, you asked me what the stretch therapy system is about. It is a, it is a, large, a, collection, a collection of a large number of tools that are specifically have been tested with tens of thousands of people. In fact, at the university where I taught for 27 years, we estimate that we taught about 25,000 people. Some, there's collections of people, so academics, um, students, outside people, the widest possible cross-section in the community. Our oldest student was 76, I think, and our youngest student was 14. Um, And we simply observed and recalibrated, so it's an empirical approach. We observed, calibrated, and changed, and are continually weighing the techniques against two constraints, Safety on the one hand and effectiveness on the other. Now, that doesn't sound like much, but when your goal is to become more flexible and to be able to move better, and everyone knows what that means, even if you can't define it too well, you know what it means. If your goal is to become more flexible, to increase the range of movement and be able to control that range of movement too, I should say that's where the strength side of things come in. And also our particular way to acquiring new flexibility, as you know, is to use very strong contractions depending on the exercise sometimes it's not strong but for big things like side splits or front splits it'll be your whole strength in fact Um, that gives you strength at the end of the range of movement which very few strength training systems do so anyway that's this is an important point that you said you take an empirical approach to this 
And it's yeah. something that I don't see very often. I find it quite interesting that your approach to science is you, you're you not crippled by the science or waiting for the evidence to come out. Um, you don't, there's, there's a very thin amount of data available on stretching. And so it seems mm-hmm. like you've taken more of a heuristic empirical approach yes. um, rather than waiting for or looking at the theory or waiting for the, the data to come out on these things. And I think as a result, you've, you've kind of, um, it, it becomes a very experiential process. Look, uh, my research area, my PhD research, the major case study was back pain. Now, back pain is just such a, a brilliant and wonderful thing to study because all of the elements that we've been talking about so far man- are manifested there. And also, Western medicine, by its, by its own literature, acknowledges that it doesn't treat low back pain very well. In fact, most articles on low back pain will start with that disclaimer. And the interesting thing to me as a logician and a philosopher is, well, that's interesting. Why is this the case? So my background, I began in medical anthropology, and I'm just so, so grateful for the, 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 the things that I learned there because it allowed me to take a step back from any paradigm that I'm working in and see what the limitations of the paradigm are. And that really was what my PhD research was about. It was actually about the limits to the scientific method. Of course, in order to speak in any way effectively about the limits, you have to understand the method itself. And in our culture, so many people who are anti-science actually don't understand anything about science. They have a they have this cartoon view of what science is. Well, now, majority... I, I get that quite a lot. People that are reactive to Western medicine as a whole, and you're thinking, yeah, yeah as you said, if if you break your arm, you're not going to go to a, a herbalist. So no. Yeah. Although, although you may go to a herbalist in the recovery phase to strengthen your immune system response and to speed the, the body returning itself to the normal, but you're absolutely right. Your first choice would not be a herbalist. And so we can see right away, we can see on that spectrum, interaction here to fix to actually put the arm back in its place, and then this other interaction from a completely different set of paradigms to help the person strengthen his healing force Actually, the two medicines are perfectly complementary. It's just people don't see it that way. If you factor in the temporal dimension, the choice of the of the of the medicine is clear. For example, supposing you didn't actually have anything wrong with you, but you felt that you were lacking in energy, or maybe your digestion's not working too well. There's no point in going and seeing a Western doctor about that because they don't know anything about those things. You go and see an Ayurvedic practitioner or um, a Chinese herbalist because. And each of those people will see the imbalances in your system which are leading to the thing that you call the problem, the lack of digestive power, let's say, or whatever it is, or lack of energy, and they'll treat it with quite different approaches, but it will be, both approaches will be trying to move your system to a more optimally functioning state. They just use different tools. So the herbalist will use herbs that work on the kidneys and liver mostly, but also on the stomach as well. But an acupuncturist will work on these little surface points that seem to have no connection in our system to what's going on inside the body, but clearly they do. Um, and an Ayurvedic person would look at your diet and say, you know, there's, a, there's an imbalance here and you need to bring more of this element into your diet and so on. You so see? it seems like there's a gap for the, the meta practitioner, the, uh, the integrator yeah. of the different paradigms and the knowing gen- which tool to use that the era of the generalist is upon us now general general practitioners of course are lowest on the totem pole of medical practitioners and yet in my view they're the most important just like i consider kindergarten teachers to be way more important than university professors way more so as a generalist for yourself so i don't know what area you're going to get into eventually but um gp actually well, that's the well, that's the goal at the moment. Well, you you would be a doctor I would personally come to see, and I'll let me explain why. What I find extraordinary, and 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 the, it just blows my mind every time I think about it, is most I shouldn't say actually most practitioners. Let's not talk about just Western medicine. Most practitioners, when you look at them, you see the fruit of their work. And so if you're dealing with someone who's obese, can't touch their toes and is sitting behind a desk, um, well, what is the message that that person is sending to you? And I'm not talking about Western doctors here. I'm talking about a nutritionist, for example. You go and see a nutritionist, and the person who's giving you this advice is in appalling shape themselves. Why should you trust? Where is there's, There's a massive disconnect between what they're recommending and what they actually do themselves. 
Well, hello. Wake up. That's what I'm talking about. And so for someone who actually walks the walk and talks the talk, as the expression has it, that's the person I would much prefer to go to than someone who just talks the talk. You don't know the extent to which their engagement with their material is theoretical. I have zero interest in theoretical, and yet I've got a better understanding of those things than most people do because I spent 15 years of my life at postgraduate level trying to understand these things. But I'm telling you, practice triumphs over theory in most instances in our human life. So this is something we've, we've written about as well. We have an article called uh, Call Yourself a Coach where we claim that unless you have at least some experience under the bar, you don't necessarily have to be um, IPF world level lifter. I mean, it helps, but um, it's not mutually exclusive. But um, without that, it's. I think it's rich to say that you know what your clients are going through. And if you haven't um, dieted down to extremely low levels of body fat, then there's no way you can appreciate the neuroses that come along with extreme dieting or any any end of uh, fitness pursuits. So something well, that's on... a... Sorry, go ahead. That's good. No, no, I'm just, I'm just reflecting on something as you were saying that. That's absolutely accurate. You know, you know I made a film starring, starring Arnold Schwarzenegger back in the 80s. Did you know that? No. <laughs> look, it up, look it up on the net. It's called The Comeback. Um, and it was Arnold's uh, attempt to win the Mr. Olympia contest when it was held in Sydney in 1980. That's what the film's about. And so I lived and trained with those guys for a couple of weeks. Um, Tom Platts, Dennis Tinarino, Frank Zane, I mean, literally some of the all-time greats in bodybuilding the big in dogs. that era. The big dogs. And what you're talking about, um, the neuroses in that last two weeks of extreme dieting. I mean, some of those guys and the, and the ones today are, are even more over the top because they're much heavier. But what a lot of people don't realize is the body fat becomes so low in some people that the fat that's in this part of the foot that's cushioning the joints, that gets used up in the last stages. And walking around is extremely painful for those guys. I mean, the things that they do to their bodies to get that last 1% of fat and water loss is quite extreme, I can tell you. But think, anyway. Well, yeah, with, with the advent of drugs and the way that modern bodybuilding is going, conditioning is becoming more and more dialed in to the point where you're thinking, this guy's going to have to be losing fat out of his eyeballs soon. You know, it's uh, yes. pretty horrendous. So you're actually, so you're, you're speaking to a, a pretty specific population that all train in quite similar ways. So I, yes. I, I wonder whether we would all develop similar dysfunctions or similar patterns of tightness what are the common issues that lifters powerlifters bodybuilders would experience on a physical level and then how does that translate into what you said about the mental tension and the kind of the way that people choose to hold themselves and this um character armor that you mentioned as well well let's start with the last part character armor is a universal phenomenon and that term was first coined by wilhelm reich who was Freud's, on some, in some people's estimation, Freud's cleverest pupil. There were a bunch of them around at the time, Pearls, Lohan, and there were about four of them, five of them. But Wilhelm, who incidentally died in a federal penitentiary for May and was had been charged with mail frauds. So it's a very interesting story, the Wilhelm Reich story. <clears throat> Excuse me. He claimed that when the baby first comes into the world and... Certainly, this is what we see when we look at a brand new child that say we've passed the trauma of birth. And we're looking at the child who's fat and happy and six months of age, let's say, unable to talk. But they look at you with those goo goo eyes. And when you look back at them, you, know, you have that very strong heart connection instantly. When you feel those little bodies, there's no character armor there because those the bodies have not had to react to something. The ego hasn't formed. So it's not forming protection between itself and the world at that point. And the reason why we love looking at babies' faces is because they're completely open. And it's almost no human beings are completely open. There's no filter in the way. You look into a baby's eyes, you're looking deep into their soul. Right? Everyone's had that experience. And your heart opens. Assuming you're not a psychopath. Right? That's a universal thing. Okay, this is fascinating. But when the, when the child starts to find life irritating or 
there's interaction between the mother and the father and the child or the father and the child or some outside agency in the child, Reich said that every insult, every perturbation to that child's system is embodied as a pattern of tension. It's very small in the beginning. If you've had something horrible happen to you, though, if you were abused as a child or you have a very difficult upbringing for whatever reason, maybe your family is extremely poor, who knows, I'm just, I'm extemporizing here, but whatever your external circumstances and the internal reflection of those external circumstances is, it is all embodied. So getting back to the hated father-in-law example that we spoke about before, that when you think of the hated father-in-law, you, your body re-experiences the shape it made in interaction with the hated father-in-law. That's the memory, actually. The memory is actually the shape of the tension, the feeling, the pattern of the tension. All the positive emotions are relaxations of those tensions. Happiness. Just think about the last time you laughed. <laughs> Boom. Body state, if you're paying attention, changes completely. Or, my favorite example, you hold a little baby and you look into its face, and all that happens is you feel this melting opening sensation in this area of the body here, that's your heart opening. Anyway, so now getting back to the specific question for this, this particular audience. In my experience, the patterns of flexibility in Olympic lifters, power lifters, and bodybuilders is completely different. If someone can actually do an overhead squat, right? So squatting down to the ground with the bar in the snatch position, the catch position of the snatch, if the person can do that, they have all the flexibility they need to do Olympic lifting. Yeah, ask a bodybuilder to do that, and that is no way. Laugh. Yeah, yeah, it's it's very funny to watch. Okay, so now I'll tell you something from my own history. Tom Platts, um, who also competed with um, with Arnold Schwarzenegger on stage in that film that I made, he had extraordinary flexibility. He's a bit like Flex Wheeler, amazing flexibility. Um, Tom used to finish his posing routine by basically stand, doing a standing pike in perfect form. And this guy had, had legs bigger than your waist. He was an amazing guy. Very nice human being too. Okay, so the task, in my opinion, is not to try and identify the trends that we see, let's say in powerlifting compared to Olympic lifting, because the individual's own flexibility or own restrictions are far more important and far more varied than anything we can say generally across those two systems. Normally, power, power, let me finish because this, this, is, this is a complex, complex idea. Normally, power lifters are not very flexible. And if they're lifting according to the rules, so they never squat really much below a half squat, um, and <laughs> well, they don't. That, but that is that, such the, an Olympic the, lifter the, thing to say. <laughs> well, but but it's also accurate, and also they can lift. They can the exercise they call a squat is not the exercise we would call a squat. It's a completely different movement. It's much more a hip hinging movement. It's much more like a a super loaded good morning, if I can put it that way. Yeah. Really, yes. because they use a super low bar position on the back. And they incline their trunks forward at least 45 degrees. I've seen some top power lifters where the trunks are inclined past 45 degrees. Have you seen it? It's amazing to see. And so the joint that's actually doing the most work is the hip joint. And that's perfectly reasonable because the glutes are the most powerful extensors of the spine in relation to the legs, right? And hamstrings as well. But an Olympic lifter, because other things are in play, the, the bodies literally adapt to the constraints of the activity. So an Olympic lifter, there's no Olympic lifter that can't do a full squat. Why? Because you have to be able to do a full squat to get in the catch position. There's just no way around it. But power lifters don't have to do that. And in fact, I would not be, I would be using stretching exercises with a power lifter, and I've worked with some of the world's best power lifters, by the way, only to treat physical problems in their body, not to improve their range of movement. And that's something that most people don't realize. The most useful use of stretching exercises is actually to, to check in with your body to find out what it needs and then to give, what it, give it what it needs. Now, very few people use stretching exercise that way. They'll say, I don't have sufficient T-spine extension. This is why I'm missing my catches in the snatch, blah, blah, blah. So I'm going to do stretching exercises to redress this lack of capacity. And again, no problem. 
with doing that. But once you've actually got the fundamental flexibility you need for the activity you're engaged in, then the dimension of flexibility training that can be useful to you beyond that is how to optimize your experience of being alive. And that is where we engage in practices where the goal is to have as little tension in the body as possible. And this will come perhaps as as a surprise to your listeners, I'm not sure, but um, there is no downside in any athletic activity in being more supple or being more relaxed. Now, most people don't see that. The, 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 The end goal of most people's strength training is to get stronger, and I understand that. Olympic lifting and powerlifting both have two very simple to understand goals. Both the, the goals are to lift the most weight. Three different lifts in the case of powerlifting, two different lifts in the case, well, used to be three, but now two different lifts in Olympic lifting. The way those goals are achieved, well, Olympic lifting, as you know, is a function of speed more than anything else. Powerlifting, completely misnamed, it's, it's absolutely about maximum strength. In fact, that you, you've seen some guys in deadlifting, for example, they take could take eight seconds to lift the bar into the finished position. Now, Olympic lifting, 0.8 would be a very slow lift, right? I mean, so we're diff- talking about completely different orders of physical skill sets in, in a way. But once the range of movement is sufficient for the activity, so in the case of someone who's an Olympic lifter, you need to have that T-spine extension, you need to be able to position your arms in the catch position, and you need to be able to get down into the bottom position of a squat. Once you've got those things, and the activity of Olympic lifting itself will give you those things for the most part, maybe not the thoracic extension, that normally needs a bit of extra work for for various reasons, we can get into that later. Um, Then we use what people would see as stretching exercises only as a tool to interrogate the body. If you're on the verge of an injury of some sort, when you put your body into different positions and feel what QL feels like today or you stretch back and you feel what your quads feel like or you you know do something else and you feel what your lower back feels like once you can you will feel a restriction in the body a long time before an injury will occur if you're challenging your body in this way and so if you want to remain injury free we don't use stretching exercises specifically to fix injuries although we can it's it it's not that. It's actually gaining an insight into what's going on in your own body. So That's what, what they're most useful for. So you're saying rather than trying to sort of anticipate what the identifiable patterns will be from your activity, it's about <clears throat> exploring your own restrictions, finding what they are, and moving into them to become. So, so really, then, what's what's the what's the impact of strength training um, in general on? becoming on the pursuit of becoming um, supple, injury-free, and flexible, and how can you then counteract that? Um, the interaction between these activities, of course, is not as simple as, uh, you know, weight training makes you tighter and uh, flexibility training makes you looser, although that is how... Let me take a step back from this. The way the mind contemplates all things, it's always dualistic. Almost no one looks at things and is immediately considering the options between the two posited opposites or alleged opposites like getting stronger makes you tighter, getting looser makes you weaker. That's I've, I've heard some people say that. No, no, I can't do any stretching exercise because I want to have that you know, maximum strength in the bottom position. There's no relationship between those things actually. But that's what the mind the mind comes up with. So to answer your question, because I work with so many different people in Olympic lifting, powerlifting, and also bodybuilding too, whilst we may say, generally speaking, Olympic lifters have enough ankle flexibility, and then we have to say in brackets they have to have enough ankle flexibility if they can um, catch in the bottom position. I mean, if you can squat, you've got enough ankle flexibility, right? That doesn't mean that it might not that some additional ankle flexibility might not improve your catch position. It probably will. But again, it takes a skilled coach to look at your body and to see how you're adapting, how you're solving those problems is a better way of putting it. So when you clean and you catch, how are you catching? Where are you catching? So a good coach should be able to give you, he'll say, uh, or she'll say, no, you need to, the pull has to continue for a split second longer than when you're trying to get under the bar. You need to pull a bit higher, pull a bit higher, come up on the toes, and now snap under the bar. 
that's done in you know a tenth of a second that part of the movement right that the transition or two tenths of a second so i think for olympic lifting the, the the best input that a coach can give you is actually about how to improve your technique and that's the thing that will reduce the likelihood of an injury but in powerlifting it's a different thing powerlifting as i said doesn't require any great flexibility literally everyone on the planet is loose enough to have a bar touch their chest right they're loose enough to do a deadlift normally in whether it's in good form or not that's a that's a whole different ball game but most people are actually flexible enough to bend down and grab a bar that's about this high off the floor right a bar sitting on 20 kilo plates it's not a big ask and in the squat well most people have the flexibility to be able to do the powerlifting style squat. So if That's we use not, the squat it, as an example then, so we have mm. um, someone who's deficient in ankle, in, in dorsiflexion, let's say, mm. um, where are you on the spectrum of you know you using the squat as a loaded stretch to improve it and just say you just need to train the squat more? Or mm -hmm. at what point do you take a certain element of the movement and say that needs to be trained separately so that you can then bring it back to your squat? Look, I think that's, that's a, well, this is the thing. It is That's an extremely good question, and I guess that really plays into my the first point that I made, which is we can't make any general recommendations. Um, we can't. I don't think we can say Olympic lifters need to concentrate on this series of exercises, powerlifters need to concentrate on this series, and bodybuilders need to concentrate on this series. The difference between individuals is way more than the differences between the generalized patterns that we see in each of those activities. And see, one of the reasons why, one of the reasons why I parted company with uh, gymnastic bodies, um, and I was quite close to them at one point, is because the people in control of gymnastic body wanted to have a sets and reps approach to stretching. They wanted to have a formula. People, they, the, the, the guys wanted to have just a program that they could put on, follow the program, and you'll become more flexible. Now, if it was that easy, Yusuf, I would have done that, you know, 30 years ago. It's not that easy. And what we found is that acquiring flexibility, whether it be for the specifics of a sport or whether it be simply to experience more grace and ease in the body and to be more relaxed generally, the acquisition of that flexibility is like to black art. I mean, look, here's the thing, and we, we haven't mentioned this yet, and this, but it's an incredibly important idea to get on top of. Most dancers and gymnasts become flexible when they're children. Now, the problem set of how to take a child's body and to help it acquire a range of movement that an outsider would describe as flexible is a completely different set of problems than to take someone of your age or my age and move them from less flexible to more flexible. And this is one of the great confusions in the industry is that people will go along and they'll watch um, kids, say, training at a dance class or, and they'll see them as doing what we would regard as a stretching routine. But no, for, for someone that's been in the dance world for five or ten years or gymnastics, what looks like stretching to you, it's just a limbering routine, man. That's what they call it. I used to go to limber classes at a dance school. I went every morning for two years before before work. And these kids were warming up by moving between side splits and front splits. They hadn't even started the limbering class. That was their normal range of movement. This is what everyone doesn't understand. So from the outside eye, so it looks like stretching. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And and it the significance of them doing side switch was just as significant as me touching my ear now. There's no, I would ask these guys, Russell, I remember Russell, Russell Cunningham had the most extraordinary flexibility. I said, to Russell, Russell, what does that feel like? And he just looked at me blankly and said, what do you mean? What does it feel like? Didn't feel like anything to him. That's the point. And I was struggling to get my legs 90 degrees apart in those days. And so I was looking at these people thinking, fuck. They actually live in different bodies to me. That's the truth. And so that's an extreme thing. But the point is, in the gymnastics world and in the dance world, they will look at how the children get flexible and they'll try to translate to that to their adult students, and it just doesn't work. Right. So it's a different problems. We are the experts in taking stiff, inflexible, tight, 
adult bodies and helping them to become supple, flexible, relaxed. That's actually what we're experts at. So this is something I think is worth exploring because I can see people with a mechanistic my, this this runs up against people with, a, with a, the mechanistic mindset of, but surely it's just an adaptation. It's just a physical thing. Of, so so surely you can just distill it down to sets and reps, and there's nothing more to it than that. How can you? How, how do you answer to that? And how do you? Um, what I'm what I'm interested in really is coming back to this character armor thing again, and if you can talk about some of your experiences with people. This is where we go a bit off piste. <laughs> People talking about having released an issue with their father that they've had or whatever as a consequence of stretching. And mm. um, yeah. It, it, it is not off piste at all. And that is the misunderstanding that most people have about what flexibility training is really about. Look, let, me, let me give you another thought experiment um, for your audience. Just imagine. The task is the next thing you're going to do is you're going to put your hands on the floor, you're going to slide your heels apart, and you're going to go down into side splits. Right? Now, if you have side splits in your body, you'll say, okay, and you'll just slide down into side splits. But if you don't have slide splits in your body, what is the experience in the body? I could feel my adductors cramping up just hearing that. So, yeah. No, it's, it's, it's much more primal than that, Yusuf. The experience is fear, stark terror. Now, here's the thing. This is not obvious. When you move your body into a range of movement that the structure clearly is capable of, but, but which is not in your experience base, the fight or flight response is triggered at force 10. And no one talks about this stuff. There's the el the elephant in the room is fear. When you go into any strong stretching position, and which will be a strong stretching position that depends on your past life experience, the structure of your body, the things that you've done and haven't done, blah blah. For women, that emotional response is most strongly triggered by doing full back bends. Usually, for men, it's side splits or front splits. Anything which you find a, a real challenge. Now, I have to add. Side splits and front splits are not important for, for health or daily life functioning or any of those kinds of things. Of course, it's not at all. But nonetheless, people who are involved in gymnastics strength training, they all want to have that level of flexibility. And people like Ido Portal and others around the place who had a massive influence on that because he's, he's very flexible and very strong too. Um, and so, again, it's, what we're experiencing in our culture is what I call a structuring myth. If remember we were talking before before we started recording about the Hollywood myths or the, the Disney myths of and she lived happily ever after, right? Well, a structuring myth here is um, the desirability of front splits and side splits for someone who's doing Olympic lifting or powerlifting. There's just no relationship between those things at all. They're not in any way useful or helpful. But some of your audience will be wanting to do those movements. Or my favorite, from because I'm a meditator, as you know, my favorite is people who write to me and say, I want to be able to sit in full lotus. I'm a meditator. I'm learning how to meditate. I, I want to be able to sit in full lotus. And I write back and say, why? And they say, well, because that's the proper position. That's the authentic position for meditation. I say, no, it's not. It's not. If you can sit in the lotus position comfortably for an hour, you'll find that a very stable position. But the number of yogis who've broken their knees trying to sit in full lotus because their body structure won't allow it, they're not supple enough for it, or they're too heavy, they're too big, so the actual combined thicknesses of ankles and thighs are so much that the, the external rotation they have in the hip joints is not enough to allow the movement, and so the knees take the thrashing instead. Well, the, most, most re the reason why most people can't sit in full lotus is they're simply holding too much body tension. I don't know whether I demonstrated this on the workshop that you were on, but when I put my, did I show you that? Yeah, when you, I did. Put, you can get it right up into your hip crease. Yes, when I went, well, when I pull, let's say, putting my left heel onto my right thigh, the left heel is actually pressing into my abdomen, and there's a there's a technical and esoteric reason for that. But the point is, the reason I can do that is not because I'm super flexible; it's because my quads are completely relaxed, and what happens is the ankle literally sinks into the leg. When I sit in lotus, and I've got a YouTube clip on this. But when I sit in, in full lotus, um, the top of my ankle is actually just underneath the level of the quad. The quad's soft enough to move out of the way. 
That's why we want to have a supple body. So it's I think to do that. So this element about this thing about fear that you're saying is something that I think if somebody is a lifter and they're used to having a certain set of predictable inputs, stimulus response, and they can produce an output, mm -hmm. and then they think, well, surely flexibility can be the same thing. So I can just apply that model to flexibility. And you're saying that it's not as simple as stimulus response because of this fear reaction, because of the the the, the neural components to it, I suppose, and the, the emotional um, holdbacks associated with it, going into splits. It's even deeper than that. When you work on your flexibility, you are literally working on yourself. You're working on your pattern, the things that literally make you, you. Now, what's the connection between that and, say, um, moving your squat from 140 to 160, let's say, or 150? Well, there's no relation at all. I mean, only to the extent that the belief in yourself in being able to endure the intensity of the experience of um, singles, doubles, and triples in order to get your strength from 150 to 160, it'll be just as difficult to go from 140 to 150. If you're near the end or you're reaching your capacity in any particular lift, it but it feels the same. It, it, it the, the movement from 140 to 150 and the movement from 150 to 160, the experience and your capacity to keep going when your body is saying, for God's sake, stop, right? The intensity is the same, yeah. It is the same, but your capacity is greater. Now, what's crazy about about flexibility training is actually the opposite to that. And again, you won't read about this anywhere. It's actually much easier to become flexible once you have become flexible. The initial inhibitions, the initial restrictions to making a change are the things that you experience as fear because the experience is unknown to the body. And the body, well, actually, let me put it in a cellular so you must have seen this, no organism on the planet, no organism on the planet responds to stress by opening, lengthening, and relaxing. No, it's always closing, protecting, holding, always. And that's, that's universal. You poke someone, boom. universal. So we acknowledge the universality of that and the reality of that, and we show people how to move past that initial resistance. That's one of the keys of our system. Now, I can explain very quickly how to do that if you want. So that's it for part one of this interview. You've got to come back next week where we cover the process of how you deepen your awareness to improve your flexibility and strength, as well as finding your tight spots, improving your grip strength, and also the deeper physical and therefore emotional impacts of lifting and working at a desk job, as well as much more. So be the first to get updates. Remember to subscribe on iTunes or YouTube, and you can always get full show notes on the website, propanefitness.com, as well as email updates if you download our free ebook, Five Tips to Maximize My Fitness Pal. So look out for part two, and we'll speak to you next week.